Welcome to our 2019 J. Tuzo Wilson Public Lecture. This lecture, as many of you know, is an annual event put on by the Department of Physics here at U of T. Each year we commemorate the life and work of John Tuzo Wilson, who was one of the key discoverers of plate tectonics. Plate tectonics is to geoscience as Darwinian evolution is to biology. It is the framework into which everything else fits. If you've attended previous lectures, you've probably heard that statement before. Tuzo Wilson's association with the Department of Physics goes back to his undergraduate days. In 1930, he was the first Canadian student to graduate in the field of physics and geology. Then he headed off to Cambridge, then Princeton, then the Geological Survey of Canada, and during World War II, he served in the Royal Canadian uh, Engineers. Then in 1946, he received a call from Professor Burton, who was the head of physics at U of T at the time. Professor Burton asked him if he would accept the position of Professor of Geophysics in the Department of Physics. He accepted and he moved uh, to Toronto in June of 1946. Those were the days, a uh, full professorship um, with no university experience uh, beyond his PhD, which I think was actually in geology. Apparently he was also the only Professor of Geophysics in Canada at the time. He remained in that position for almost 30 years, during which time he made a series of famous contributions to the ideas of ocean floor spreading and continental drift that were the, uh, the heart of plate tectonics. He was certainly an acknowledged leader in the study of the Earth. Tuzo Wilson's influence uh, extended well beyond geophysics. He was a scientific leader in many uh, areas. He was appointed as the first principal of Arendelle College, now U of T Mississauga. And apparently he entertained some 10,000 guests <laughs> in his home over a period of seven years, or I think, uh, as his daughter said, uh, he and his wife uh, entertained those 10,000 guests. Um, that is a very impressive <laughs> number of guests. Uh, he also served as president of the Royal Society of Canada, director general of the Ontario Science Centre, and chancellor of York University, and uh, was a recipient of many, many honours, which I will not uh, read out. So we commemorate Tuzo Wilson and his many contributions with his annual lecture and with the J. Tuzo Wilson Professorship in Geophysics. This professorship is awarded to a geophysicist at U of T for a five-year term. The holder presents an inaugural lecture during the first year of their term and organizes a public lecture by a distinguished geophysicist for the subsequent four years. So I'm delighted this evening to introduce our newest J. Tuzo Wilson Professor, Professor Chinya Liu. So please join me in uh, congratulating her on her appointment. <laughs> professor Liu is an associate professor who is cross-appointed in both the Department of Physics and the Department of Earth Sciences. She received her Bachelor of Science from the University of Science and Technology of China, UTSC, USC, USTC, in 2000, and a PhD in geophysics from the California Institute of Technology in 2006. She held a Green's postdoctoral fellowship in the Institute of Geophysics and Planetary Physics at the Scripps Institute of Oceanography at UC San Diego, before she joined us here in the Department of Physics as a faculty member in 2008. Professor Liu is a computational seismologist who uses seismic data to probe the structure of the Earth's interior. She is a leader in developing and implementing sophisticated numerical techniques to pair into the Earth's interior. In this, she is a very fitting successor to John Tuzo Wilson. So please join me in welcoming Professor Liu to tell us about her groundbreaking work on exploring the Earth's interior by full seismic waves. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you very much, Kim, for uh, that introduction. I'd like to thank the nomination committee um, for uh, nominating me for this Tuzo Wilson chair position. It's, it's a great honor to carry on the, the tradition uh, of this, depart this department as, as well as U of T in devotion to geophysical research and teaching. So I'm, I'm extremely honored. And as uh, Kim just mentioned, that I will be helping organizing the Tusa Wilson uh, lecture in the next four years. Um, but today, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about my own research. So, and, and I'm very glad to see that we've got colleagues and old friends and also students in the back uh, all coming, coming to, to, to hear a little bit about uh, my uh, work. So um, let's get started. As Kim mentioned, I'm a seismologist. So um, seismologists study earthquakes. 
And um, this is the subject you probably hear very often in the media. And I'm showing here, oops, let me just, I'm showing here uh, pictures of the uh, Tohoku, Japan earthquake magnitude 9.0 in uh, occurred um, on March the 11th, 2011. As you recall, this is a, a devastating earthquake that caused a uh, very large tsunami that wiped out uh, coastal uh, regions or coastal uh, villages of, of, of uh, parts of Japan, and it also caused the meltdown of the Fukushima uh, nuclear plant, uh, which is a, a, a really um, a big disaster. And um, you may also recall one of the devastating earthquakes in this century, or I guess in, for the 21st century, um, the 20, 2004 Boxing Day Indian Ocean earthquake, uh, um, magnitude 9.3. That's the, the largest earthquake we've recorded in, with modern instruments. Um, it also ha caused a large tsunami, which uh, propagates throughout the, the Indian Ocean as well as parts of the South China Sea, um, and, and, um, and taken um, as, as many as uh, uh, almost a quarter million lives. So what are earthquakes? Well, um, they're, they're, natural, uh, they're devastating natural disaster, di disasters, um, but, but really, fundamentally, physically, what's happening is you would have uh, to two sides of a pre-existing fault uh, slide against each other in a sudden motion. And that sudden motion causes a dis disturbance, and that disturbance gets propagated in Alaska media um, because the elastic media always has this tendency to try to come back to the equil equilibrium position, just like how a mass attached to a spring always wants to go come back to the equilibrium position. And that wave gets propagated out um, and causing seismic waves. And because the energy of these large earthquakes, earthquakes or great earthquakes are so big, the waves can actually penetrate deep into the earth and come back to the surface, um, uh, 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 basically the other side of the globe. Earthquakes are, are, are disastrous, but also there are associated hazards such as tsunamis, uh, volcanic eruptions. Earthquakes can, can uh, trigger eruptions uh, uh, in volcanic region. You can also have landslides, avalanches, and also liqui uh, liquefactions. Now, how often do earthquakes occur, and what are the energy levels that they, uh, they release? Well, if you look at this graph that shows the number of earthquakes per year worldwide, um, basically uh, uh, as a function of magnitude. Um, basically, earthquakes occur all the time when they are very, very small, but, but they are generally not felt by the, by, by the public. They can be picked up by very sensitive instruments. But if you go up on the scale, um, look at magnitude seven earthquakes. It occurs a, almost a, about one per year on average. I'm sorry, one per month on average. And if you look at magnitude eight earthquakes, it really kind of occurs uh, one per year. And the very big ones, the magnitude 9 earthquakes, you can see, uh, you know, we have a list of them here. Um, we've seen large ones in, in, the, in the 60s, the Chile earthquake and the Alaska earthquake, and 64. And, 64. and um, we've also got a, a handful, of, uh, a few of them in, the, uh, uh, in this century, uh, the Sumatra, Japan, and Chile earthquakes. So, so really, um, earthquakes is, is a natural phenomenon, and, and um, there are the, 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 high, uh, the sort of the one end with, with all the great earthquakes causing large uh, uh, devastations to both um, human lives and, and infrastructures, but on the other end, you'll have these relatively small earthquakes which actually can tell you information about the Earth um, interior. So one of the tasks, of course, as a seismologist is to try to understand these earthquakes and, and use them to map the seismic hazard and, and basically understand how likely is an, a, a, a region being struck by an earthquake and what are the magnitude of those earthquakes. Even though prediction of earthquakes are, are unlikely, or, or at least you can't predict an earthquake like you predict the weather, but you can uh, generate these so-called global seismic hazard maps, which then tells you the the expected peak ground uh, shaking, so in terms of peak ground acceleration uh, uh, in, in, in number of G, so the, the red color here shows the peak ground acceleration in, in, in the order of uh, one G um, ar around the globe. And, and you can see that the seismic hazards are really kind of uh, concentrated in, in, in zones. You see the ring of fire around the Pacific Ocean, but you also see this broad zone of deformation uh, basically caused by the collision of the, 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 the Indian uh, uh, continent as well as the, the uh, Arabian uh, 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 plate into the Eurasian plate. 
And if you zoom in at the North America, you can see, well, of course, we have uh, generally the, 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 the largest seismic hazard on the West Coast, where, of course, the, the subduction zone or the play boundary is, is in action. But we also have somewhat moderate seismic hazard in, inland. Um, here in, 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 in the United States, so-called New Madrid seismic zone, we have the South uh, Quebec seismic zone as well, uh, uh, not too far from us. Now, if you look at the distribution of earthquakes globally, um, again, they are similar to this hazard map you've seen. They're also concentrated on very narrow zones. And of course, the reason these earthquakes occur or these sudden motions in, in the subsurface occur is because of plate tectonics, as we already know, um, for, since the 60s. Right? So plate tectonics, as uh, Kim mentioned, that it re really revolutionized the Earth's um, um, earth science since the 1960s. And what the fundamental idea is that you can partition the surface of the Earth, uh, or at least the very shallow shell of the Earth, you know, 100, 150 kilometer uh, shell of the Earth, uh, into these, these plates. And these plates are not rigid, uh, are not static. They actually move around. And depending on the relative motion of the plates, you can have subductions. So you can see these subductions are um, on the West Pacific. Um, underneath uh, uh, Central and South America. And you can also have plates that are moving uh, 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 away from each other, which, which are the mid-ocean ridges where the uh, hot magma comes up and form the uh, new uh, oceanic crust. But then you have the third type of boundary called transform boundary, which is actually one of the contributions of, of uh, Professor uh, J. Tuzo Wilson, who we are commemorating today. And if you um, look at this, the three main um, contributions or key ideas that we now contribute to uh, uh, Tuzo, and, and that's thanks to, to a, a very great article that Gordon wrote um, for the Canadian Journal of Earth Science. Um, one of them is that the hotspot hypothesis, and that was considered very radical back then, and I couldn't even publish in traditional, you know, Earth Science Journal, it has to be published in the in Canadian um, Earth Science, um, well, uh, picked up by Earth, Canadian Earth Science Journal back then. Um, and the idea was that the, the, the Hawaiian island was formed because you have these, the, the plates systematically uh, moving horizontally, long-term differential, uh, uh, moving across a, uh, underlying ma uh, mantle, which we now as think of as a plume that's uh, uh, coming from the deep um, uh, mantle. The second contribution is to find the transform force. That's the third type of boundary that I just talked about, uh, which really link together the, the other two type of boundaries and it explains the, the, the motions um, on things like uh, fraction zones. And the third is the so-called Wilson cycle and, and why the ocean basins open and close uh, actually uh, repeatedly in the past um, and not necessarily in the same place. And these are really fundamental ideas that, that augmented the existing uh, 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 you know, mid-ocean ridge and subduction zone uh, hypothesis out there and then really bring, I think, plate into a, a very unifying uh, theory. Now let's go back to earthquakes, which also contribute to the understanding of the motion of these plates. Now, like I said, earthquakes are sudden motions on a, a pre-existing fault or, or um, uh, in, in, in the crust. And um, you, I'm gonna show you a movie and, and you can see the type of waves that are generated by earthquakes. So if you have an earthquake starting here, there are typically two type of waves. There are others we'll talk about in a minute, but mainly the body waves that would, which penetrate through the earth and the reason it bends up is because of the velocity increase of depth. Um, but then there's another type of uh, waves, which is the ones that propagate along the uh, surface that we would call the surface waves. And if I play this again, um, the body wave has two types, the P waves, which arrive first, and then there's the S wave, which is called the shear wave that arrive later. Um, and then there's the surface wave, which has the largest amplitude and oftentimes the most uh, damaging to uh, uh, um, buildings and inf infrastructures um, on the surface. Here, just showing the motion of a, of a primary wave, uh, a shear wave, um, and then um, surface wave, which, is our, uh, which, which goes on as these elliptical motions for radio waves and the uh, in and out the plane for love waves. Um, and seismic waves, especially large earthquakes, they generate seismic waves of a very wide spectrum. So here I'm, I'm showing you the spectrum really of, uh, that, that can be excited by um, all kinds of seismic, or, or earth, uh, or seismic waves. The, 
For example, uh, we were talking about body waves and surface waves, so this is a bit off. Um, and, um, and then if you look at the kind of more lo uh, long period spectrum, you look at the normal modes or even cross cell definition, that's a very uh, long term scale. But um, there's actually a, a small subset, or uh, I shouldn't say small subset, but a, a very important application of seismic wave propagation and, and seismic Im imaging in industry for oil and gas exploration, as well as hard rock, phys uh, hard rock um, uh, mineral exploration. And that, that has to do with using seismic waves to uh, at much higher frequencies where we're looking at you know, much, uh, you know, th things in, in, in the 10 hertz, uh, 20 hertz, and even in the, uh, um, in the other end, the acoustic waves that can image uh, very fine scale uh, structures. So um, basically any sudden motion inside the solid earth or elastic body can generate seismic waves from uh, uh, global earthquakes from, uh, to nuclear explosions. You can also talk about micro seismic events from fracking or um, even acoustic emission in rocks that, 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 that are done in, um, at lab scale. And these waves, uh, when they propagate through the earth, especially from, from large earthquakes, um, they can be picked up by sensitive instruments uh, around the globe. And there's, uh, uh, there's continued uh, uh, global efforts to build these so-called global seismographic uh, network, which uh, distribute around the globe to, uh, it, uh, at the very beginning, the history was to for nuclear uh, uh, treaty uh, enforcement uh, purpose, but now it has been expanded to really um, understand um, earthquakes and, and, and the structure of the earth. Um, and you can see uh, the distribution is, is not quite even. Some of them are, well, actually a lot of them, majority of them are on the continents, while um, on the, in, the, in the ocean it's mostly on the islands. There's some efforts out there that are trying to put in, uh, put things like uh, OBS or the ocean bottom seismometers, but that's um, uh, quite an expensive uh, uh, endeavor. And if you look at the waves recorded by these global um, net networks, uh, mostly they're, they're uh, the, the, the strongest signal you're seeing are the surface waves. And these are actually multi-orbit surface waves that go not only from the source to the receiver, but actually uh, uh, in, in, in multiple orbits around the globe and, and back to the to receiver. And they are confined to the surface and mostly sensitive to crust and upper mantle structures. And then there are these body waves that arrive uh, earlier uh, with weaker signals. And they have a smaller amplitude, but they dive deeper into the interior of the Earth and are important for determining the structures of the deep mantle. So, so now we've already talked about you know, uh, seismic waves that are generated by earthquakes of, of different spectrum. So how do we really use these waves to, to image the Earth interior? Well, that's not too different from, from a CT scan that, that you might have seen. Um, so in, in a CT scan, the patient would lie on this motorized table, which then go slowly through this ring um, and on, on this ring mounted the X-ray sent source on the top and then a series of uh, detectors at the bottom. And what happens is you would ro um, uh, rotate the source and detectors and as the X-ray coming from the source go through the patient's body or as, at least a slice of it at this uh, position and then gets picked up by the detector and depends on the, the, the path that the X-ray goes through, the, am, uh, the amplitude or the intensity of the X-ray being picked up by detector may vary. And based on that information, um, and, and actually rotating the sensors and, and, and sorry, rotating the source and detectors, you may, you may be able to get a full uh, 2D and then 3D image of the patient's uh, uh, body. And that's very similar to earthquakes. Um, you, the earthquakes are our sources, and these uh, instruments, these sensitive uh, seism seismometers, are our uh, detectors. And uh, when the earthquake send out waves, it gets picked up by the receivers. And especially if you have a lot of them. Oops, sorry, um, this is supposed to play. Right. Um, if you have a lot of them, one going uh, off from here and gets picked up by the receiver, and then another one also going off gets picked by, by the receiver. And when all these waves kind of uh, it, uh, go through a, let's say, an uh, uh, anomalous body, they would all see um, a anomalous signal. And by inverting um, the, those anomalous signal, you would actually be able to figure out where the anomaly um, is. 
But there are actually fundamental differences between medical imaging and seism imaging. Now, in the medical imaging case, you actually control where the sources are, where the receivers are, and you can actually rotate the source and receiver uh, um, um, and around. But for seismic imaging, at least in, in for earthquake seismology, we cannot control where the earthquakes are. We know where, where they typically are, but they are where they are on the boundary, on the plate boundary. Um, I mean, the, but, but in, in industry, um, in oil and gas industry, there are these active source surveys, um, which then you will have some control or where the sources are, but still it's going to be most likely on the surface of the earth. Um, but on the, re, on the wave side, instead of looking at X-ray, which is very high frequency, we're looking at, at elastic waves. Um, uh, which can have a quite f uh, uh, spectrum. Um, if you look at the recorded signal, um, in, in the CT scan you're looking at intensity, so basic amplitude. Now in seismic imaging, you know, they're, they're, uh, we're actually recording the displacement as a function of time, which then you, you construct things like travel time of phases, amplitude of phases, or even the four waveform. Um, and, and Based on these uh, recordings, you can go back in CT scan to look at the density or composition of, of the material that the X-ray uh, uh, goes through. But in seismic imaging, we're interested in elastic properties like the P and S velocities, uh, which is mostly uh, sensitive to, for, for travel time, and things like anisotropy uh, or, or unelasticity, which can then tell us the inter in interior um, uh, composition deviating from the standard um, elastic elastic properties. Um, so with all those seismic waves, um, we're actually able to understand the Earth's structure pretty well. Um, unlike, I don't know how many of you watched this Hollywood movie in 2003 called The Core, unlike the heroes and heroines in this, in this movie who had to travel, well, they have to actually drill their way into the core to, set, to, to basically set off a, a set of nuclear explosions to to restart a rotation of the um, Earth to fix the magnetic field? Well, the reason we know um, in, 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 uh, that the outer core is fluid, the inner core is solid, um, actually as early as um, 1918, that, that uh, Gutenberg determined that the core minor boundary is at the depth of 2,880 kilometers. And that's only 10 kilometers away from the, from the current day uh, estimate, which is 2,891 kilometers. So think about the, the precision you can actually get um, even from size and waves back in 1918. And also, um, um, we, we have the, the so-called um, uh, 1D print model, which was built based on basically uh, uh, previous work um, in, in, in the 80s that shows the structure of the Earth uh, in, in terms of crust, a very thin crust, a, a mantle, um, and then which can, can be can be deforming and convecting in, at geological time scales, which really is the fundamental reason of plate tectonics, and the outer core and, 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 and inner core. And, the, and the, the amazing thing about this 1D model is that even today, you know, this is already 40 years ago, uh, that even today, the prediction from this 1D model to telescizing PNS waves can be still accurate to less than 0.1%. So that's, that's very um, impressive. Now, of course, the Earth is not through 1D, right? I mean, if you think about the, the, the topography you have on the surface, and also the interior of the Earth that can have 3D heterogeneous that are away from the uh, uh, um, 1D average. Um, so I'm going to show you three examples of using seismic waves at the scale of the globe um, to image the Earth's interior. Um, and the first one is... Oh, The first one is the, um, the imaging of the subducted Farallon slab beneath uh, North America. So, um, so this is thanks to the effort of so-called US Array, which I'll mention later, that, that managed to image this, very, this blue anomaly. Now, typically in seismic tomography or seismic imaging, when you see something's blue, that means something that's kind of cold, dense uh, material that, that tends to descend uh, into the mantle, or, or in this case, it's a subducted slab that descends into the mantle. Um, and, and this slab, as, as you can see, this is actually underneath uh, sort of mid-eastern uh, United States, and that's or, or North America, and that's where we believe the, the old Farallon slab, or the remnant of the old Farallon slab that's, that's, in, that's trapped in the uh, uh, mid and lower uh, mantle. 
And this is an, another interesting uh, uh, observation, which actually uh, was spotted as early as the late 1970s by seismic tomography methods uh, uh, um, that, that, that were, uh, uh, Jawonski was very, uh, Professor Jawonski at uh, Harvard was very uh, a key uh, contributor of. And this is called the Large Low Shear Velocity Provinces, LOSVP, which colloquially people call, it, call them super plumes. So there are actually two super plumes. One is under uh, uh, Africa, one is under Central Pacific. And, and these two super plumes, they have very interesting properties. They, of course, like I said, they are low velocity in shear, in, in shear velocity. Um, but um, they also have tend to, it, it turned out people have shown that they have, comp, they're compositionally distinct, they're denser, and they also cause these super wells on the surface, which has no, anomalous uh, topography, which can't explain by, by the, 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 the surface plate tectonics. Um, and the third one I found interesting, I, and actually I got this from listening to the um, CBC radio, and they were talking about on the radio um, this, this thing called Canadian Arctic Ocean Continental Shelf Submission to UNCLOS. So UNCLOS is the United Nations Convention on the Law of Sea, or um, it's, it's an international treaty that, that sets out the legal framework for ocean activities and boundaries. Um, so basically, the, the treaty states that, and, um, uh, that, that every no nation automatically receives a um, 200 nautical miles off their coast. Um, basically, they have so sovereignty rights over that. But and it also states that um, it also has so so rights over um, uh, extended content beyond the 200 nautical miles if it satisfies certain uh, uh, criteria. So, so, so starting from 2003, the government of Canada and, and, and basically a, a sort of a scientists um, from uh, various agencies, they set out to collect scientific evidence to, to basically map out the extended continental shelf of, 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 of northern Canada. Um, and one of the data they collect is seismic data. So, that you, so what you do is you shoot seismics or, or send out these active source uh, seismics into the uh, subsurface and they get reflected back to the surface and, and you can collect the data and use those to image the, the subsurface. And in this particular case, um, you know, they, they did seismic reflection, seismic refraction, and they submitted you know, 2100 uh, 20, pages um, to, 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 the, uh, to the treaty. So, um, and, and, and I think what, what, what the goal with the seismics is that you can really map out the morphology of the continental shelf as, as an extension of the continent and, and use that as an evidence for, um, for, for the claims. Now let's talk a little bit about the physics behind it. Um, we, we already talked about seismic wave propagation, starting from if you have perturbance from a, 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 a source, earthquake, um, it generates waves which can then propagate through the, the interior of the earth and um, gets picked up by receivers and you see surface wave and PSS waves. Now, the, the, the fundamental equation this is the only equation I'll show. Uh, the fundamental equation that satisfied by the propagation of seismic waves is really just a Newton's second law. It's, not, it's no more complicated than that. And, and it, but of course, it's applied to a continuum, which, you know, which is the Earth, and that says densely multiplied acceleration is equal to all kinds of forces, which includes the divergent stretch, which is basically the continuum, um, the result of, 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 of in the continuum. And you can also have forces like gravity, and then of course, the forces that are caused by earthquakes. Now, it turned out, um, this equation, even though it seems to be quite easy, um, it turned out it's, it's quite difficult to solve uh, given the complex structure of the Earth, um, especially in 3D. So for, for a very long time, people sticked with um, travel time. As a, and, and, and because travel time is easy to, to calculate, and you can use these high-frequency approximation to relate travel time to basically velocity along what we call this, uh, a seismic ray. So instead of looking at the waves propagating out, you only look at the, the ray, and, and that's very similar to the geometric optics that, that you, you might have seen in, 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 in physics. Um, and with that, you mostly use travel time information um, for your uh, imaging purpose, and travel time you know, is also known to be less nonlinear than waveform um, or the amplitude, so that has been the prevalent uh, imaging method for um, at least, um, and it's still one of the most prevalent pre uh, prevalent imaging methods. Um, now the question is, how do you go beyond the ray theory? And actually, if you look at the literature uh, over the, the 90s and early 2000s, a lot of efforts are going into 
go, going into search for what we call the finite frequency sensitivity because we know, looking at the spectrum of the, the seismic waves, you know, it, it's not only high frequency, right, which is why, which is where the, the uh, geometric array theory is applied. It actually has a range of, uh, of frequencies. And the instruments that are recorded at these global networks, there are broadband instruments that can can actually pick up a wide range uh, uh, of frequency signals. So in order to account for the finite frequency effect of wave propagation, all kinds of uh, 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 ways have come, uh, or methods have been proposed to really account for not just the sensitivity along the ray, but sensitivity really kind of uh, uh, in the vicinity of the ray. And here is, is one of the asymptotic methods based on normal modes. There are ways based on um, uh, body wave ray theory. And, and, and so either you have to make some approximation to your um, uh, uh, solution, or you have to assume certain type of media. For example, a lot of efforts are putting into calculating an accurate solution for 1D Earth model, such as PRIM, um, and, and, and with that to compute the corresponding uh, sensitivity kernels. But what about the whole four waves, right? We, you know, we've got the entire seismogram. Why don't we just use travel time? Why don't we use the four waves? Why don't we always have to start from 1D model? Why don't we start with a 3D model that we already have? Well, actually, the, the roadmap was laid out as early as 1984 by a, a, a great uh, uh, mathematician, the late um, Albert Tarantola, who really said, that you know, for an inversion, well, he, he was looking more mostly at seismic reflection data, but it really applies to any seismic inverse problem or seismic imaging problem that has to do with uh, fitting the waveform and, 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 and um, inverting the waveform. It says that now in the any inverse problem it really requires two simulations. If you want to take the uh, solve the the um, sorry, this is losing. If you really want to, yeah, if you want to really. Um, get the, the update on the velocity uh, material properties, well, you have to uh, uh, do an iterative procedure, which require, every procedure require two calculations. One is called the forward propagation um, from the source, and then one is the, called the adjoint propagation, or they call backward in time uh, propagation of the data residual. And, and, and it's not really hard to imagine physically what's happening. Well, let's say I have a source and a receiver, and the black one is my data, and the red one is a prediction from, let's say, 1D print model or a simple background model. Now, I know and I can see from this that the data and synthetic don't quite match each other. And then the reason probably because there, there are scatters in the media where the waves hit the scatter and then scatter off that scatter and gets them picked up by the receiver. So the question is, how am I going to use that difference between the data and synthetics, the red and, and black, to go back and map those scatters, which is deviation from the 1D model. Um, and clearly, in order to do that, you, you would have to know how the waves propagate from the source to the scatter, as well as how the waves propagate from the scatter to the receiver. And using source to receiver prosody, that's the same as understanding how the pro waves propagate from the receiver uh, back to the scatter. So you need two calculations of wave field. One is source to scatter, one is receiver to scatter. And that's just really the kind of the fundamental uh, physics behind how you can use waveform to resolve the, um, these scatters. It turned out that, but basically, like I said, the computation of these sensitivity, basically uh, uh, how my uh, observed signal is sensitive to the structure, or partial S, partial M, it really requires two uh, wave field calculations. And, and that basically says, in order to really account for the waveform, you need a way to accurately simulate wave propagation. It's basically solving the full wave equation instead of making approximations or assuming certain type of models. And, and, and this full waveform inversion technique uh, was somewhat applied in, in the um, 80s and 90s with, with some success in, for small scale industry problems. And, um, and the reason it wasn't quite, um, so, uh, quite, quite widely applied, and I, I kind of make, make this analogy, is you know, everybody wants to climb the Himalayas, right? I mean, that, that's, you know, a lot, I guess a lot of people wants to climb the Himalayas. And you may even have a roadmap to how to get there. But for, for a person to really get there, you need years of uh, planning and training. And, and, and the key ingredients that's missing back then for full waveform inversion is the computational cost, is the computational power. We don't really have the computational power to carry on, uh, to carry a lot of numerical simulations of the wave propagation, and to accurately compute the basically this, these sensitivities or these derivatives uh, uh, to the model. 
not in, uh, in, until somewhere around early 2000s um, that, that the computational power has really become available to academic researchers in, um, um, as well as uh, become a feasi feasibility for industry. And here is a, is a little graph that's showing the growth of floating point performance of supercomputers, the top one, the top, uh, the, 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 the 500th, which I'm, sh I'm sure it's still much got more powerful than my laptop, um, and then the sum of them. You can, you can see the growth in, in computational uh, power, uh, really thanks to things like supercomputers, and this is one of them. I'm showing a, bit, a, 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 a nice picture of Niagara, which is the newest uh, um, iteration of our uh, of, of the uh, high performance computer at Cynet. Um, it launched last year with all, uh, more than 60,000 cores, and it's the most powerful supercomputer in Canada, uh, at least for academic purpose. Now, with the power of computation, you also need to have the good algorithm to solve for the wave, wave equation, which you've, we've, you've seen. Um, typically, back in a uh, finite difference was, 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 was quite uh, uh, frequently used. Uh, especially in, in industry and in early uh, academic research, starting from the 80s, because given its, its relatively e easy uh, implementation. Um, and this is just a little picture showing a, an effort to do a scenario earthquake in Southern California, um, from a rupture from the south of Palm Spring um, all the way to Los Angeles Basin. Um, but, but what the final difference often suffer is that it cannot really accurately capture the topography and it has problem uh, taking advantage of the, the velocity increase with depth in, inside the Earth. And given the complexity as well as the, uh, um, uh, the, the three-dimensional uh, uh, heterogeneity of the Earth, as, as well as the spherical um, geometry of the Earth, um, it, it's not sufficient, at least for global simulations. And that's why people, um, starting from early 2000s, people have been looking into the so-called spectral element method, which is a, a, a higher higher order finite element method and has now become one of the most uh, popular and, and actually uh, I would say a standard method for simulating wave propagation both um, at scale of the globe as well as uh, um, regionally. And I, I was very lucky um, when I started out my grad school at Caltech, I was part of the, the groups who, who uh, started developing um, these codes. Here I'm going, um, and, and actually the, these efforts turn, um, uh, continued, continued on to become a, a, a project called Shake Movie. Um, this is a project uh, that's, that's led by Princeton University, which basically autumn, uh, or in near real time, whenever there's an earthquake, uh, larger, I think, the magnitude 5.5 occur around the globe, um, they would actually produce a uh, simulation of wave propagation based on spectral element method, um, and, and actually, uh, Put, put out a movie, um, both for the, for the uh, public, um, the media, as well as for scientific purpose. So here I'm just gonna quickly show you a movie. I'm not sure why it's not blurred. There you go. Of a earthquake, a magnitude 7.7, .7, uh, uh, October 28th, 2012, uh, uh, in, in Haida Gwaii, which was formerly known as Queen Charlotte Island earthquake. And you can see um, the earthquake, uh, uh, the waves propagating out from the earthquake, and, um, and there are these fainter colors, rings, that are basically the body waves. Like I said, they have weaker uh, amplitudes. And the very strong ones are actually the surface wave. And you can see they're actually dispersive, um, that they, they actually, uh, the rings are actually uh, fatter than, than the body waves. And it turned out the, um, these simulations are actually very accurate. If you compare the recorded data, so in black, and the synthetics, or basically the prediction from spectral element simulations for a uh, um, Argentina earthquake. And the reason we picked this earthquake was because this earthquake was deep, so that you don't, uh, so that the body waves are, aren't swamped by the surface waves, and you can really see the good fitting between the data and synthetics. Now this picture, uh, now this um, screen is a bit grainy, but if you really zoom into it, you'll see there's still tiny differences between uh, uh, the the red and, and black for some phases. And those are the ones that we were going after to further improve the um, Earth structure. Um, like I said, and I was lucky enough to be part of the, you know, the, the group to, to compute the forward simulation of wave propagation, but uh, and also spent my grad school implementing 
the so-called sensitive kernel calculations into those uh, 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 packages. And, and recall that you know, in order to compute these derivatives or sensitivity, you need one forward simulation from the source to the scatter, and you need another simulation from the receiver to scatter. And then you interact these two fields, basically correlate these two fields to get these sensitivities, which, um, sh which should somewhat go along with the ray path, but uh, with a broader uh, sensitivity. And here, I'm just showing uh, uh, the sensitive of so-called SMS phase, as well as an interesting phase called the P-diffracted waves that diffracts along the core boundary and leaves an elliptical uh, footprint. Um, um, so with these, uh, the accurate simulation of the sensitive kernels, then you can go back and do the full waveform inversion. And sometimes we call it adjoint tomography for uh, earthquake uh, calculations or earthquake application or earthquake seismology applications because um, there's just a, a lot of practices that are slightly different from the full waveform inversion which originally started from the, uh, uh, the exploration seismic uh, community. But basically, I'm, I'll be using them interchangeably. So I'm gonna show you a typical a workflow of waveform inversion and I'll show an example of how it works and I'll show you more examples of how it's applied around the globe. So what you do, you start with a initial model. So what, whatever the best knowledge you have about a particular region. And what you do is you uh, take that model and you run full waveform simulations on that uh, model. And you get, of course, prediction of what the recording should be at your stations. Then you compare it with the actual observed data. You look at the difference and you take that difference um, you compare and you window that difference, you make so-called frequency dependent uh, measurements, and you feed that, and you use that as a source to feed into the simulation again, so this is the second simulation. And you interact this forward simulation with that, sorry, this adjoint simulation with that forward simulation, you can get the gradient or the sensitivity I was talking about. And you get these, these nice pictures of how, uh, where, which parts of the model is, uh, is not sufficiently representing the initial model. And then um, you take that, those derivatives and you go back and you update your model. Basically, you, you know where your uh, uh, residuals are sensitive to. You update your model to kind of reduce the residual. You update your model um, and then, and then you, you see if the model converges. If it does converge, then you're done. If not converging, you can go through this loop again until you, know, you satisfy the best fit you can, you can produce for your um, data. Um, now I'm gonna show you an example that, that's, that, that's one of the uh, work that I, I was part of, um, of adjoint tomography of East Asia. So this is, uh, this, this is the work that's led by uh, uh, Min Chen, who is now a, a faculty member at uh, Michigan State University. And um, East Asia, it's a, a very interesting tectonic region. Um, it, it, it's like I, when, when I talked about the seismic hazard, we, we, we already talked about how this, this is a region where you have continental continental collision, where the Indian plate is uh, moving north and colliding into the Eurasia plate, and, and which give rise, or which resulted in the uh, um, uh, um, in the uprising of the uh, um, uh, Tibetan plateau. You also have subductions along the Japan Trench and the Izubaning uh, system um, on, on the uh, um, uh, 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 east of the region. Um, you have also the Mariana Trenches, uh, sorry, uh, sorry the, um, the Mariana Trenches, which is, you know, is known, known to be the deepest um, in, in, in the ocean floor. And, and you also have very large variation of topography that you, you need to account for when you do these numerical simulations of wave propagation. So uh, what we did, is we picked, uh, we um, collected about data for about 227 earthquakes with magnitude between five to seven. That's shown here. And we used uh, uh, recordings from 1,869 stations. Now, and the reason we have th that many stations is, is I think the, um, if you look at the distribution of the uh, stations, there are a lot of stations in China that, that thanks to the effort of the uh, network over um, there that, that put out a, a, a real large number of broadband stations and also similar, the FNET stations from, from Japan. Um, and we started with, instead of a print model, a 3D initial model, um, the S362N9 model, plus the CROSS 2.0, which is the, um, um, the CROSS-TO model. And we actually made measurements of about 1.7 million frequency-dependent travel time uh, from, from body and surface waves. 
Um, I'm going to skip this slide. But um, so what, what happens is you would take the, the data, which is in black, and the prediction, which is in red, and you try to make measurements on selected windows. And um, with these finite frequency measurements, you can go back and, and update your model, and you track how your model would, would uh, reduce the misfit between data and synthetics over eight durations. So this is over 20 iterations, the misfit is, is, is significantly reduced. It's also reduced for various components and various, uh, various frequency bands. And you can lo look at all the model quality uh, assessment by looking at how the uh, uh, measurements has uh, really uh, shrinked in, in its magnitude. Original measurements are in, in green for um, the initial model, and the final measurements are in red for the final model, which uh, are more centered around zero than the initial model. So what do the final model looks like? So here you can see already a little bit of the advantage of using adjoint tomography or four-way from inversion than traditional uh, surface wave tomography uh, or tomography techniques. What I'm showing here are a comparison of the shear velocity models. Um, on the left, these are the, our model at 50, 100, 200, 300 kilometer depth. On the right is the best, or at least I, I consider it one of the high resolution global shear velocity model um, from uh, Schaefer and, and Lebedev um, in 2013, and it's one of the best um, high-resolution S models out there with tr the, the, what we consider as traditional tomography techniques. And look at the, the difference of these two models. Look at, at 50 kilometers, and clearly, um, if you look at Tibet and Plateau, pretty much in, in their model, it's, it's shown as this red kind of slow velocity perturbation. Well, in our model, there's actually variation from slow to fast, where the slow um, is pretty much um, um, under, if you know a little bit of technology, the, the Changtang block and the Songpan Gansu block um, here. Um, and also, the other thing you can point out is if you look at the trenches, the Japan trench and the Izubani system, in their, uh, their trenches are uh, 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 shown typically as uh, subductive slab as fast velocity anomalies or cold uh, blue colors um, are pretty uh, pretty broad, while our changes are actually fairly narrow um, from the imaging. Now I'm going to just go, quickly go through a set of applications uh, of, uh, of various groups, uh, full waveform inversion, adjoint tomography applied around the globe. It really started in the early 2000s, like I said, when people realized that the computational power can make full waveform inversion uh, feasible at um, earth, for earthquake seismology, basically. And um, people started with looking at the Los Angeles Basin. You, know, see, you can see the basin is quite slow. And then um, this is kind of a, 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 um, a follow-up work uh, recently for, for the Southern California crust. You can see the basin is still somewhat slow there, but overall um, other places um, showing various of, um, um, uh, of, of, of heterogeneities. This is our work back in 2009. Um, for the Southern California crust at 10 kilometer depth. Again, uh, you can see the basin, LA basin is showing as pretty slow velocities, but you also see the, uh, the peninsula range showing up as uh, quite fast velocities. And this is another work by uh, um, uh, basic back, back then the, the, the Muni group looking at Australian uh, uh, continent. And you can see there's on the eastern margin of the Australian continent, there's this relatively uh, sl slow velocity anomaly uh, against the relatively uh, uh, thick, cold, um, uh, cratonic region to the west of um, Australia. There's more work um, in, for, for Europe, Europe and North America. Um, and you can see here, this is in, in Europe and this is uh, in North America. And you can see, again, the, the, the so-called Farallon play, the, the, the subducting, um, uh, the remnants of it uh, subducting underneath uh, uh, North America. Um, at about 260 kilometer depth. I think the most exciting or interesting uh, uh, result I've seen in, the, in I guess, the past uh, uh, year or two is this recent study um, of adjoint tomography in Antarctica. Um, here, um, I'm showing you the, the um, this is by the work by Lloyd. Um, I'm not involved in the work, but I just found uh, uh, well, some of my collaborators in the work. But, um, I, I wasn't directly involved in the work, but I found the, the, the imaging really uh, uh, astounding. On the left, we're showing the, or, um, the initial model. Now, the initial model is already 3D. It's a global model that's generated uh, by um, actually the, the best data set they can, they can sample back in 20, uh, 2008. 
Um, if you look at Antas uh, Antarctica under that model, it's pretty much just this, this relatively blue, sort of cold, thicker lithosphere underneath East Antarctica. Um, and you don't see much, really, of West Antarctica or, or, or the surrounding region. It's really broad, smooth features. But if you look at on to the right, that's the, the, the recent results they just published in, uh, in, 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 in the paper um, of uh, the, uh, the, the same region. Um, you can see, yes, it confirms that the west, uh, sort of the eastern Antarctica is, is, is the slow, sorry, this fast, cold, probably uh, uh, thicker lithosphere. Um, but you see a lot more details out of the uh, west, uh, eastern Antarctic, right? So let's see. Um, here you have the droning mall land, and all the way uh, up to Lambert Garden, uh, Gra Graben, that, that shows as rough, rough, roughly weaker slow, uh, fast anomalies than the other parts of uh, East uh, Antarctica. And you also see these relatively slow velocity anomalies coming, coming off from the Mid-Ocean ridges here at the uh, Balani Island um, uh, um, along the um, Amundsen Sea and then and the, uh, the Ross uh, embayment. So I think it, this really tells you the power of these kind of uh, four-way from inversion techniques, which is that um, they provide, because you're fitting not just the travel time, and, and you're fitting the really broadband waveform or frequency-dependent travel times, you, you provide high-resolution, high-fidelity images um, than the previous generation of the traditional tomography um, techniques. And there are also efforts going on uh, to look at edge tomography for the whole globe. This is a picture of the uh, uh, Abru Bostock's uh, paper in 2016, which they did 15 iterations uh, around uh, for the global model um, called the GLAD M15. And here it's highlighting the slaps and plumes and hotspots that are enhanced by this model um, that there are much uh, in, that there are in much higher resolution than previous generation of global models. And the new generation of the uh, uh, adjoint tomography uh, global models are, are in, in, in the production um, with a six-fold increase of data. And, and here you can already see a little bit of the, the, the possible challenges of, of doing adjoint tomography, which is you have to deal with a large amount of data, you have to do a lot of numerical simulations, and computational costs can be um, quite expensive. There's also other groups, so this is the, the ETH group, um, uh, led by Andres Fickna, who, who, uh, who's looking at more workflow-based automatic four-way from inversion at the scale of globe, basically taking uh, each region out and, and updating those regions and putting it, then it back to the, uh, the, their global model. So what are the opportunities and the challenges with applying four-way from inversion? I hope, I, I hope I've convinced you at this point that, that it, it is an amazing technique. Um, it does provide images that are uh, much finer and much more detailed, and then which you can then take to do uh, better geodynamic interpretations or uh, um, uh, of te tectonic modeling. Uh, um, and, and I think the opportunity is here is that uh, we, should, we should take advantage of the ever-growing seismic array deployments. I'll show you some of those in a minute. Um, and also leverage advances in high-performance computing, um, not only just uh, the, 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 the cluster we're seeing, but uh, things like the GPU architecture, you know, things like machine learning or fast I.O., et cetera. Um, but also, um, the FW, uh, FW or full from inversion at the scale of the continent the globe, it, it still remains quite numerically expensive. So the, 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 there are works in, um, that they're putting in to understanding uh, uh, how to do better optimization and inversion strategies. And I think it requires a community-based effort um, on software development and also maintenance to, to really keep this effort uh, uh, um, uh, going for the general uh, or the, uh, the wider earth science community. And I think the future development of four-wave inversion, at least for earthquake seismology, really relies on, I would say, these four bullet points. Well, continued deployment of regional stations in the race. So the more data, the better. Um, the four-wave inversion can only do so much if your data is limited. Um, if you have better coverage, it's always better. Uh, it's always going to provide you a better uh, uh, image. Um, um, also, we, should, we need to explore the, 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 the recordings and look, up, look for new data sets. So we can talk a little bit about ambient noise. And also, you should look for speci special signals in the seismogram, such as scatter waves that can help you uh, resolve fine-scale structures in, in, a, in a particular way. Um, 
Um, I'm not going to talk about the four waveform simulation also, but I, I think there's a, a great opportunity to use these four waveform simulations um, in, in doing better source characterizations. Um, so let's talk, first talk about the seismic deployment, or uh, uh, this, this big de deployment work. Um, really, I think a, a beacon for it is, is really kind of the, the Lissapro Lissa project. I, my understanding started in, in 84, and it kind of lasted 22 years. And really, uh, it, 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 it had about 10 transects through, the, through Canada, uh, Canada, really kind of uh, building on the diverse geology uh, um, of, of Canada from the West Coast to the East Coast, and, um, and it, it, ha it, it collected a reflection seismic data, refraction seismic data, as well as um, uh, magnetic telorics data, really putting together the geology of the lithosphere across uh, uh, um, the continent. And, and later on, in, in around early 2000s, the US uh, put together this US Ray project, which deployed instruments starting from the West Coast all the way, kind of sweeping through the continents, um, with very dense instrument spacing. And I would say, you know, th this generation of US, or at least uh, including some Canadians, uh, uh, scientists, are really kind of, kind of, kind of uh, uh, benefit from this, this enormous, pro uh, pro uh, 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 enormous data set that allow people to do all kinds of interesting science as well as developing all kinds of interesting uh, methods. Now the deployment's right now, right now in Alaska, um, I believe it's going to uh, continue on this year and, 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 and beyond. Um, but there is a, a effort uh, that's going on called, called the Canadian Caldera Array. Caldera is the mountainous region in, in the west uh, of Canada. And, and the goal of this uh, uh, array is to kind of piggyback banking on the uh, US array and moving some of the instruments, hopefully, over to the Canadian side and um, also bringing a lot of other Earth system science observations into uh, into this array. So, so I think with these different array deployments out there, um, the hope is that we'll get more data sets, uh, uh, we'll get more data, and, and then we can also use um, various type of data. So I mean, noise, when I, uh, I talked about if you have two stations sitting there just recording noise, it turns out if you take the cross correlation of them, it actually gives you meaningful signal, like a Green's function, and you can use those signal to image the Earth interior. This is one of my postdocs who worked on uh, looking at the, um, uh, so, uh, so uh, uh, Kai Wan looked at the uh, uh, radio anisotropy of uh, Southern California, and we actually spotted very negative radio anisotropy west of the San Andreas Fault, which we think either is caused by the steeply dipping amphibole or maybe horizontally aligned uh, uh, plagioclase, which literature has shown that to tend to have a negative um, radio anisotropy. Um, there's another type of data set called linear arrays. Other than the, 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 the sort of density deployment across, you can have this linear arrays with very fine spacing. And this is one of the works we did um, uh, using linear arrays and ambient noise. Um, you can also uh, use these linear arrays, um, but in, the, in, the, in a kind of innovative way, instead of looking at the main P arrival, you look at the scatter waves, which are coming from interactions with the uh, heterogeneous right beneath the receivers. In order to do an efficient full waveform inversion of a region uh, uh, like that for, for global earthquakes, um, we tend to have to use something called the hybrid method so that you really limit your simulation just underneath the receiver array and um, outside use a, a 1D solver. Um, and, and this people have, have done in, the, um, in recently looking at the, at the Pyrenees uh, with an array that's, that's as dense as 10 kilometer spacing. And, and, and they, they were able to uh, image the very deep roots um, uh, beneath the Pyrenees. So I, 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 I don't rush a little bit um, at the end, but um, I hope I've convinced you um, that, that the seismic imaging is transitioning uh, from traditional tomography methods into full waveform inversion based on basically sensitivity kernels computed by full waveform simulations of seismic wave propagation. And in combination with expanding data sets out there, um, whether it's a seismic network or temporary arrays, um, full waveform inversion does provide a, a provide unprecedented high resolution and robust image of the Earth interior at, at um, all scales. Um, I think the, the continued incorporation of innovative data sets um, uh, will further improve the coverage and the enhan enhance the uh, image quality. Um, and, and I think the future of high resolution imagery really comes from these three parts. You know, of course, we have to continue pushing the boundary of the high performance computing. 
we need to have more data sets, or actually four of them. Um, we need to come up with innovative inversion strategy to make the combination more efficient, the inversion more efficient. But we will also, I think, need to have a community effort to, to continue our software development and, and maintenance so that these techniques, um, they, which are expensive oftentimes and, and, and quite difficult to use, can be uh, spread out um, to, to the community. I'm going to leave with one quote from the announcement of the 2013 SEG workshop of on fully from inversion, which they claim that fully from inversion has emerged as the final and ultimate solution to Earth uh, resolution and imaging objective. So with that, I'm, I'll end my talk and I'll take questions if there's any. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that great talk. So I think we have a few minutes for, uh, for questions before we uh, head out for refreshments. So uh, any, uh, any questions? Yes, there in the back. Yes. Hold on, you need the mic. I was wondering with uh, really good uh, models for predicting seismic activity, could it be possible to predict earthquakes in advance before they happen? Um, it, well, I mean, it would be nice we can do that, but, um, but I think that there, there, there are definitely challenges. Like I said, it's very hard to predict earthquakes, but, but there's, there's, there's definitely uh, uh, things we can do from better seismic models to do things like scenario earthquakes, right? So if you have better understanding of the structures, you know when, they, when an earthquake strikes someplace where no known faults, how it would propagate. If you have regions of slow velocities, like in a basin, you would have amplifications of the waves, and that would tend to cause more uh, damage to the to buildings and infrastructures. So certainly better models will provide better seismic hazard assessment. Um, I, I've seen studies where when, when they come up with better models, they, they actually can identify earthquakes that tend to occur on the boundary between the fast and the slow velocity anomalies. That's a, a handful of instances they've seen, especially in uh, subduction zones. So that could be used as a additional information in understanding the overall picture of, of where and why earthquakes occur. So, yeah. Right down the very back, yes. Thank you for your talk. Uh, I might have a slightly different background to a lot of people. I don't, I'm not a physics major, I'm a structural engineer. Mm -hmm. My question is a bit of a follow-up to that question. Um, have you done any work with structural groups, especially in California? I know you studied at Caltech. There are a lot of right. uh, structural researchers working on exactly the same problems from a slightly different perspective. So have you had any collaboration? And again, on a follow-up on your answer to that previous question, have, do you think these methods are helpful for calculating better return periods in quotes, for example? Um, we see more and more earthquakes that are quite different from the regular return periods, like the New Zealand earthquake, where you know the distribution of the P waves and the S waves and the vertical horizontal components were quite different from usual earthquakes, let's say, and they were like you know thousand-year-old return periods. We see more and more of those these days. Do you think these methods can help develop better quotes? Okay. Thanks for that. A thousand questions there. <laughs> um, but um, but so, so, so first of all, in terms of the collaboration, so, uh, so you're, you're talking about how we can couple these codes maybe with a structural analysis or understanding how the, uh, the displacement would actually affect uh, the building, the integrity of the building and so on. I, I don't have personal collaborations, but back when I was Celtic, we, we, do, uh, we do have group members who look at um, um, basically once you produce these displacements, how you can feed those displacement into a structural analysis code for a, you know, let's say for a building, and see how that displacement would affect the various uh, uh, um, you know, components of the building. And I've also had uh, interactions with a, uh, more a, soft, uh, a structural engineer, uh, but who's using spectral element method also for wave pro uh, simulation on um, in coupling the, 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 the basic the solid earth with structure together. So right now we're just doing wave simulation in the solid earth, but he's actually coupling the solid earth with um, uh, structures like a bridge or a building. So, so potentially you can do those things, um, but of course simulation with like those, that tend to they tend always run into problems of resolution. Right? You know, if you want to have a good resolution for buildings, and that's going to be very different from the resolution you can get from um, solid uh, uh, wave simulations. So um, in terms of understanding different spectrum, I mean, er different earthquakes do carry slight different spectrums. 
Um, and, and, and also depending on where you are um, in, in the direction of propagation. You know, if you're in the direction of propagation, you tend to have a, a amplification just because of direct activity effects. So that would have larger amplitudes than if you're sitting at the back uh, where uh, the propagation is, is, is behind the propagation. So, so, so those uh, factors, and that's why I think with a better velocity model and also better earth, uh, uh, earthquake models, you can couple them together, you can uh, simulate them together to produce a more realistic scenario for when a, a earthquake um, does strike. Um, my question is, uh, um, the Cascadia subduction zone in the Pacific, not lot far off the coast of Canada, uh, do you have any um, uh, prediction for how that might develop in the next uh, 200 years from now? Wow, that's, I know, I, 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 I don't want to, uh, you know, I, well, we, we always know that it is a region very prone to earthquake because of, because of subduction. When a Puka plate is going underneath a North America plate. So we know that. So this definitely has got really uh, significant seismic hazard. And then we also know in 19, I, I think in 1700, there was a big earthquake, magnitude 9 plus, occurred. And, and the question is, you know, what is the occurrence time? And people think the occurrence of a few hundred years we may be due for one in the future. But the question is, is it tens of years, is it hundreds of years, right? So I, I, I think. There's, there, there needs to be more study going into understanding the nature of the subduction and, 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 the, and the faults that associated with the subduction and, and the recurrence time of those earthquakes to, to better understand, to, be, to give not a prediction as, as in weather prediction, you know, whether it's going to be the next hour, but at least in the, in the tens of years and, and hundreds of years frame what the probability would be. Um, but it is, yeah, we, we still can't predict it precisely, of course. Hi, uh, you've shown us that the Earth in the top 1,000 kilometers has a lot of really interesting structure whose purpose will become clear in time, but in a sense, this is the low-hanging fruit because it's close to the surface. If you can call something that requires 60,000 computers low-hanging fruit. But uh, I've got a question on behalf of all the people who, like myself, watched the movie The Core and came away okay. confused. <laughs> And that is, can you use these techniques to actually probe for structure in the core to see if it's anything more exciting than just a uniform spherical blob? Yeah, um, actually, they're, 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 well, not with a full waveform inversion technique, um, because as you can see, um, when you look at the waveform, the dominant waveforms are really surface waves, which are mostly sensitive to upper mantle and, and crustal structures. There's some body waves. Um, and, um, but but, but at usually the first stage, you're trying to fit the surface wave, which is the dominant signal. So really, if you want to study the core, you kind of look at specific phases. And, and really, and, and because the core is it's generally fairly uniform, or I wouldn't say uniform, generally pretty good, pre well predicted by the 1D model. So any deviation from that is actually pretty tiny. That if you want to probe that, you have to look at specific phases by stacking a lot of data. So what I, I I'm not involved in any of those studies, but I've seen a lot of work on understanding the topography of the inner core, outer core boundary, look at the anisotropy of the outer core, or sorry, the inner core, and really kind of, they, they see these, what they call west and uh, east-west hemisphere uh, differences in, in anisotropy. So, so, the, so these work, for these work, they don't quite come from Fourier form inversion yet, and as, as, as I just mentioned, Fourier form inversion are very expensive, um, for, for you to look at in the core, usually you have to use P waves of very high frequency. We're talking about one second, you know, two seconds. And the global simulations, we, we're not there yet. But w one of the stuff, one of the things we're doing in our group is to re use hybrid method to really focus the study region in the interior of the Earth. Right now we're looking at the core minor boundary. So when you have wave coming in, interact with the core minor boundary and then goes out. So outside we use 1D model, inside we use 3D model. So we're making some forward calculations on that. Um, but the imaging is going to be the next step. But, but it is challenging. You know, like I said, one second wave simulation, that's, that's very challenging at scale of school. You have a nice wish list there. Uh, let's have a bit of perspective in the future. I noticed that most of your full inversion stop to about 400 kilometer depth. Is that a fair statement? Well, that, I mean, some of them go yeah. seven. I mean, basically, I would say upper, mostly upper mantle, but, you know, like upper 
lower mantle. So not definitely not going up full okay. mantle. Well, actually, the global tomography does go for the full mantle. Yeah, but yeah. when will that be? Basically, well, I, I, I ask you a specific question. We talked about the plumes uh, responsible for the hot spot. Right, right, right. Uh, a key question that has uh, interested the people for a long time is whether the plumes mm -hmm. come from the upper right. mantle. Does it come right. all the way to the lower yeah. mantle? How yeah. long will it be before full wave analysis inversion allows us to answer that question? In other words, basically give us a good resolution down to, to the core mantle boundary. If, uh, what's well, your perspective on that? Well, I mean, this, this, this global model is all the way to, to, the, to the core mantle boundary, right? So, the, so this global model, and, and it, it's, it's really a significant endeavor. I mean, we're talking about two decades of work. I mean, I, we started this, you know, well, I was involved in, in early uh, stage of this work um, in back in early, I guess, 2000s or mid 2000s. And it has been really kind of 10 years in coming um, that they generate this after 15 iterations of this model. And, and you can see the morphology of these plumes. Some of them do end the, the as upper mantle. how deep? Yeah, that some of them do come go? from, you know, very deep in, in, in the really? lower mantle. Some of them do, like the ice, Iceland plume doesn't seem to go that deep. But some other problems do seem to go connect all the way to the common boundary. Right. So, so I think these models, and if you wait until the, the, the recent model, I, th I know they're under review, but I, I think it probably will come out soon, um, which they have even more data going into their inversion, you probably will, will get a, mm, even finer picture of what the plumes are like. But, but also remember, full wave inversion can only push you that far if you don't have good coverage, right? right. There's going to be always holes in the in the um, Earth's surface where, you know, in, especially in the ocean, we don't have enough stations. Yeah. And, and the, the, that, that's, where go, go, that's going to be the limiting factor okay. in the resolution. In, we're in about. your wish list in the conclusion, what, what do you think is the time scale for the various, you have three, a, a three items on wish oh, okay. list on your conclusion slide. What do you, th how fast do you think this, uh, expanding deployment will happen, the continued incorporation of innovative data set, mm -hmm. the uh, continued software development. This is a, a big wish list. How fast will that go? If I come back in 20 years, will, will it have made a lot of progress? Definitely, right? I mean, if you think about it, all these work started in early 2000s when people started to realize the computation powers are there, the numerical codes are out there to do this. Um, it, has, it has been taken 10 years now. It, it become a, I wouldn't say a standard method, but at least it, it, it's, it's, quite po it, it's, it's becoming popular. It, it, there's still hurdles to use it. You have to use high performance computing. You have to, it, it is a, a lot of uh, work going into making these codes working. But I think that's what I'm saying, the, com the community effort in trying to make it a more packaged uh, 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 product for, for general, or general uh, re researchers it is really important. And I think in, in the next 20 years, you'll, become, you'll see that it's become a standard te te technique for imaging uh, um, a lot of places, yeah. Okay, maybe time for one more question. So, so they were back there. Uh, yes. <laughs> Get in your exercise. <laughs> Thank you. Um, um, very great talk. Um, I have one question: Is that like these kind of uh, computational, uh, computationally complex um, algorithms sometimes seems to be prone to like artifacts from the computation? I'm, I'm wondering how, for example, how sensitive is these kind of algorithm to like initial guess or assumptions? Yeah, that's that, that's a that's a that's a great question. I mean, we're. <laughs> These inversions are linearized inversions, right? When you have a linearized inversion, you always start from initial model and you linearize your uh, solution around that model. So the initial guess, the initial model is actually very important. Now, I, I think th there, there's some things uh, for our, uh, to our advantage. For example, at, at least in, for the earthquake seismology, the, the Earth um, is fairly, is in bulk fairly 1D. So the 3D perturbation is actually fairly small. So it's, it, it's, it's okay, typically, to start from a 1D model or the best knowledge of 3D model you have. And then the perturbation is usually, you know, within, definitely within 10%. Except certain regions, you get strong perturbations, but, temp, temp, you know, typically within 10%. So I think that's all right. 
But um, but it is actually very challenging for um, I didn't talk about it, the industry. So uh, I mean, we're talking about oil and gas industry. To read to read really each image well, reservoirs. Um, you need to have. How do you come up with a good initial guess? It's actually a big problem for industry uh, for waveform inversion, because if you if you get the initial guess wrong, the inversion can take you to 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 a local minimum, which will be trapped there, and it, and it may not be uh, you, you may not get a full picture of the uh, subsurface. And you know, in industry, that's costly, right? If you drill well, that's millions of dollars lost if you don't drill in the right place. So. So that, that's definitely challenging for industry. I think for earthquake sediment, it's not as bad because our models are ten, tend to, or our anomalies are not that that large in magnitudes. Yeah. Okay. I think uh, with that, we will wrap up the uh, the formal uh, proceedings of the talk uh, this evening. I would like to uh, uh, conclude uh, by thanking Crystal Lau, who just walked out of the room. <laughs> Uh, but not only did she walk around with a microphone, but she's done an enormous amount of work behind the scenes to, uh, to help with the organizing, uh, planning and organizing and, and, and execution of uh, tonight's uh, J. Tuzo Wilson public lecture. So uh, in absentia, we'll clock loudly. Maybe she'll hear us out behind the doors. But <laughs> oh, there she is. Krista, we're clapping for you. Thank you very much for all your hard work. <laughs> Of course, I'd like to thank uh, our, our new uh, J. Tuzo Wilson professor, uh, uh, Professor Liu, who will uh, be in that position for the next uh, five years and will be organizing the next four uh, lectures, annual lectures in the series. Um, so let's also uh, thank her for her very enlightening talk about how we can use seismic waves to, uh, to probe the Earth's interior. And thank you to all of you for attending this evening. Uh, there are refreshments uh, outside, so I hope you will stay and uh, enjoy those for a while and catch up with uh, old friends and, and new friends. So thank you again for, for coming.